So, imagine you're coming down with the flu, a sudden rapid onset of a fever, a sore throat, perhaps a cough. Worried, you start investigating your symptoms online. <laughs> Some people do. And a few days later, you're not getting better. So you decide to get a doctor's appointment. A few days later, you get that appointment, you get diagnosed with the flu. And because the flu is a notifiable disease, that information is passed on to the public health authorities. So let's pause a moment and let's just think about what happened. So the first thing when you fell ill was to go on the internet. And if you used Google to search, then Google now had a search query from you with flu-related terms. And if the flu is making the rounds, Google has that information from millions of people. By the time you get diagnosed with the flu, by the time you see the doctor, that information is passed on to the health authorities, one to two weeks will have passed. So from the perspective of Google, it'll be old news. Now, this example isn't hypothetical. A few years ago, Google launched Google Flu Trends, and it was the first big example of digital epidemiology. At the time, I was a postdoc, and it became clear to me that the data about our health, the data about us being ill, about uh, being healthy, staying healthy, would increasingly bypass those traditional channels and go through these new channels, these internet search engines, channels, social media, mobile phones, mobile apps, and so on. And not only would those data streams be much faster, they would also be much bigger. Because sadly, many more people today have access to the internet than have access to functioning healthcare system. And in epidemiology, speed and coverage is everything. Something the world was painfully reminded of last year during the Ebola outbreak. So, I became a digital epidemiologist. And I started asking myself, what other problems can we address with these new data streams? Well, the diseases like flu, Zika, Ebola, they get all the headlines, but there's an entire class of diseases that regularly kills on a large scale and that doesn't make the news. And that's plant diseases. Around the world, 500 million smallholder farmers depend on their crops doing well, but help is often hard to get for them when the diseases start spreading. And it seemed like in this age with pervasive internet and high adoption of smartphones, even in low-income countries, it seemed like this digital epidemiology approach could be helpful. So a colleague, David Hughes, and I, we built a platform called Plant Village. The very basic idea, if you have a disease on a plant in your field or in your garden, you simply snap an image with your smartphone, you load it up to the site, and you will immediately have an expert look at it and help you. So this system works great. Uh, it's been online for a few years, but does it scale? There's a bit of a problem because there are only so many plant disease experts online in real time. And so we were starting to wonder, can we automate this process? Can we automate, for example, the disease diagnosis through a phone? Or, you know, put more broadly, can we teach a phone, a computer, to see what's on an image? Now, in order to answer this question, I need to tell you about a project at Stanford called ImageNet. ImageNet addressed that question, can we teach a computer to see what's on an image? And they used computer vision and they collected a huge database of hundreds of thousands of images, images showing things like cats and dogs and, and cars and, and, and horses and, and so on. And then they wanted to develop software that could learn on those images, on this large data set, and then later accurately classify an image it hadn't seen before. So this process is called machine learning, because you're letting a machine 
learn on existing data. Or the other way to put this is that you're training an algorithm on existing data. And if you do this right, then the end product, the trained algorithm can deal with information it has never encountered before. But they went one step further. They said, here, we're going to open this database. We're going to make it publicly available. And anyone who wants to train an algorithm should do it. So they launched an open challenge, a friendly competition. And they said, whoever can submit an algorithm, whoever thinks they have an algorithm that is better than the current status quo, please submit it. Go for it. And go for it, people did. Around the world, hundreds of research teams started submitting their algorithms. And then a remarkable thing happened. In just five years, the field experienced a true revolution. And then at the end, the best algorithms weren't merely better than the previous ones. They were now better than humans. So this machine learning, it's an incredibly hot and exciting research topic at the moment. It is essentially at the basis of this craze of artificial intelligence that's going on. But it's not just academic. It's how Facebook recognizes your friends when you upload an image to the platform. It's how Netflix recommends which movies and TV shows you'll probably like. And it's how self-driving cars will bring you safely from A to B in the very near future. So take ImageNet and replace those images from cats and dogs and houses and horses with images from plant diseases. And this is exactly what we're now doing with Plant Village. We are collecting hundreds of thousands of images of diseased and healthy plants with partners around the world. And we're opening that data to the public so that they can train algorithms that can accurately diagnose disease. So imagine how powerful this could be if those algorithms start coming in that are approaching, meeting, or exceeding human performance. Imagine how transformational it could be if we take those algor algorithms, we put them into an app, and we release those apps for free on the various app stores to the 5 billion smartphones that will exist in the very near future. It's clear to me that this is not just the future of Plant Village, it's a future of applied science more generally. Because if you can do this with plant diseases, I'd say you can do it with human diseases. You can probably do it, for example, with skin cancer recognition. I mean, basically, any time you have a situation where a human needs to look at an image and make a decision based on that image, you can train an algorithm to become just as good as the human. And this isn't limited to images, voice, text, audio, video, more complex data sets all together. As long as you have enough good data on which you can let a machine learn, it is only a question of time until someone will develop an algorithm that will match or exceed human performance. And here we're not talking science fiction 50 years down the line. We're talking now and in the next couple of years. And this is why these large data sets, big data, are so exciting. Big data, to me, it's not exciting because of because it's big. I mean, it's exciting because that bigness means that there are vast amounts of knowledge that are stored in those data on which machines can learn and thereby achieve human performance. So if algorithmic power is derived from data, then data is power. So who has the data? Who owns the data? Things may be ethically simple, straightforward when it comes to images of cats and dogs and houses and cars, or even plant diseases. But what about data on our health? What about the data of your personal health? Who owns that data? Who has the data on which we can train the next algorithms for personalized health, for example? 
So what data? Well, the answer may surprise you because it's not just about your past visits to doctors and hospitals. It's about your genome, your microbiome, data from your sensors, or your smartphones, your smartwatches, the drugs you took, the vaccines you received, the diseases you had, the places you traveled to, the food you eat, how much you exercise. I mean, basically everything you do in one way or another relates to health. And that data exists electronically in databases around the world, in the hospital databases, electronic health records, in the databases of the Googles and Apples and Facebooks of this world, in the databases of the grocery stores where you buy your food, in the databases of the credit card companies who know what you buy, when, where. These organizations have the data on which we can train our future digital healthcare system. So these companies, mainly commercial entities, they provide us with compelling services we love to use, and in the process, they collect a lot of data on us. And they store those data in their mostly secure databases. And they're primarily motivated by commercial gains, which is fine, but we are so afraid of privacy loss that we imprison our data in those silos, because the data is closed, it's not publicly accessible. And because of that fear, we don't let the data work for us. So remember Google flu trends, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago? Well, last year, Google shut it down. Why? Well, we can only speculate, but it's a good reminder that those who have the data on which you can build these fantastic services can also to shut them down. And when it comes to our health, our wealth, our public infrastructure, I think we need to think really carefully about who owns the data. I mean, I, I applaud Google for what they've done with Google Flu Trends. I personally am a happy consumer of many Google services I love to use. But I think it's our responsibility to make sure we don't become too dependent on services that can that can get shut down within days without any warning by a business decision that's, that's being made thousands of miles away. So how do we strike the right balance between protecting personal privacy and unleashing big data for the public good? I think the answer lies in giving each of us a right to a copy of our data. Because then we can go to these services and get a copy of our data, and then either retain complete privacy or choose to donate the data to give it to others, to give it to other research projects, or to donate it into the public domain for the public good, under the reassurance, of course, that those data cannot be used to discriminate against us by employers, insurances, banks, and so on. So implementing this vision is not going to be easy, but I think it is possible, and it has to be possible. Why? Well, at least two reasons. Number one, as I mentioned, the data are already digital. They already exist, and so because they're digital, they're also eminently hackable, and we need regulation in place to protect us from discrimination when those data breaches occur, and unfortunately, they will from time to time occur. And the second reason, is that we should be very clear that we're moving very fast into what people call this second machine age, where machines are not only much stronger than we are, but they're also much, much smarter. But we shouldn't be worried about smart machines. We shouldn't be concerned about artificial intelligence. These machines are smart because they learn on the data. What we should be worried about is closed data data that only a select few have access to. If we make the data open, then we can really let the data work for us and unleash it for the public good. So open data is not what we should be afraid of, it's what we should embrace, because it is our best guarantee that we remain in control of the algorithms that will come to run our digital future. 
Thank you.